Very often you'll hear the term plants that are good for wildlife and attracting insects and in this video I want to focus on five really good plants that do just that. I'm lucky enough to keep honeybees and uh, so I have a vested interest in, in growing flowers that are good for the bees. Um, but broadly speaking it's not just about honeybees. Bees in general are wild native bees. They need forage, they need flowers to, to get nectar from. Uh, so it's twofold really. Um, you're thinking about you know, uh, a whole range of insects and again not just bees, it's butterflies and moths as well. Um, and you can see that just from on a sunny day of seeing what's going on. Um, but we need these guys, they're the most, they're the most important thing to us. So um, if we can grow things to accommodate, accommodate them, that can only be a good thing. When someone says, what do you mean by a simple flower or a flower that is good for, good for insects, then what we mean by that is something that's not overly complicated in terms of flower structure. And I don't want to get us bogged down in terms of whether this is a simple flower or not. Um, but if you, if you ask a kid to draw a picture of a flower, it tends to be like a daisy. Now, the daisy family is a massive, massive group of plants. Um, but the beauty of them is that each individual head, if you like, at the centre of, of this, 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 this structure are lots of tiny flower parts there. And it's these, it's these sections of the flower where the nectaries are that the insects are, are looking for, obviously, to get to come and get the food that they require and that they need. Some flowers don't have this in terms of the fact that it's, it's, it doesn't exist anymore because it's been overly bred. This is a ligularia, and ligularia is a part of, a, of the daisy family, and these are large substantial plants. They need, um, well, the beauty of these, and, and especially in our neck of the woods, is they like it a bit on the damp side. But these are really bold, strong colours. Uh, they flower quite late, and you can see by the fact that, you know, already, you know, the honeybees are on them, uh, they really favour and they home in on these types of flowers. So whenever you see that sort of daisy-like structure that's not a massive, massive petals, it's a really good one to think about. Right, so just now we were looking at a ligularia, that yellow daisy structure. This is another plant that I want us to, to, to look at, which is an echinops. Now echinops uh, have the, the, the common name of the globe thistle. If you look at the flower, you can see exactly why that is. It's a spherical arrangement of tiny, tiny flowers. And if you think about the, the quintessential, quintessential thistle head, it's a mass of tiny, tiny flowers all on this amazing structure. And bees in particular, and other, other insects, butterflies, they adore them. Um, and if you're around any garden in August, September, when these guys are in flower, you can't help but notice the fact that they, they tend to be, on a warm day, absolutely smothered with, with bees, the same way that perhaps as a sedum would be. Um, and this Echinops is relatively late flowering, but one of the beauties of them, uh, in terms of the aesthetic of using them in the garden, is they're so structural. And even in our wet climate, they look great in the winter time. And for me, that is such a bonus. Um, but the, you know, the, 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 the beauty and the detail of those individual flowers is absolutely exquisite. Um, they just, they're the sort of flowers that captivate you when you look at them. Um, so there's Echinops, there's loads of different, different cultivars. Um, uh, and this one's called Blue Glitter, very aptly. So some people say, well, why, so why, why, why would this flower be better than, than another flower, for example? Well, one example of a flower that's not great for insects would be this dahlia. I love dahlias. I'm, I have a soft spot for them. Um, they do something amazing at this time of year in the garden. They're just like a, you inject fireworks amongst the foliage and, and everywhere in the garden. But in terms of how they function as a flower being good for an insect, the reason they're not much good is because they've been bred so much that those those separate flower parts that we looked at with the ligularia, for example, or the, the echinops, have been bred out of them. All the effort has gone into producing this amazing flower, flower uh, that oozes power, you know, oozes colour, um, but uh, along the way it has lost the ability uh, to uh, attract insects. It's not exclusive to dailies in the sense that I'm not saying that they don't attract insects, but those that they do attract, the ins you can see the insect, the bee, lands on the flower and it's thinking, where do I go? How do I pollinate this flower? And that for me is a really good indicator. If you're kind of, if you're, you know, if you are a novice and, and you're walking around and you're trying to establish what, what plants are good for insects, just pause and watch and see what's happening. 
if if it appears that the the insect is a not landing on that flower for very long and it goes off again very quickly there's a reason for that they will only focus on the flowers which are good for them because for them it's a, you know that it's a priority it's a food source it's not an aesthetic thing um, so that's a that's a very simple thing you can do now structure is everything with with flowers and the salvia family much like the family that the uh, the ligularia belongs to is immense it's absolutely enormous but it does include uh, plants like these and this is uh, a plant called verbena verbena hastata uh, and being in the salvia family you can always tell when you're dealing with the salvia family because if you feel the stems they have a sort of a square ridge to them um, very stocky things and some of them like our climate others certainly don't like our climate um, but there are a great deal that are com uh, entirely suitable. Verbena hastata, it's, it's a tall plant. I mean, this one's growing in a, in a container, but it works just as well in the borders. And in terms of our, our, our thinking about whether these are good for insects or not, well, these are extremely good because the salvia family includes plants like lavenders. And you, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen a lavender on a, on a, on a hot sunny day, which is absolutely teeming, teeming with bees. Verbena hastata has these uh, very, very beautiful uh, flower structures and along the, the flower spike itself is a mass of tiny individual flowers and it's these very, very small individual flowers that the bee, the butterfly, will, will visit uh, uh, one at a time. So whilst on the face of it this doesn't perhaps look like a, a large flower head, what you have is um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of individual small flowers on a single stem which is beautifully designed for insects um, and that is so true for a, a vast range of these plants. Uh, this is another another really good plant I want to show you, um, good for insects. Um, I like it particularly because it's, it's good in shade. Um, so far we've looked at, at flowers uh, that love the sun um, but most of us have an area which is either a bit awkward in the sense that it doesn't get full sun. Uh, Japanese anemones are, are perfect for that. Um, you can grow them in pots and containers, they have to be a, a fairly decent size. Um, always happier in the ground, which is true for, true for most plants. Um, but the Japanese anemones have, again, that sort of simple, relatively simple structure. Um, they're in the rose family, and again, if you think of a sort of a wild, say, dog rose, um, growing in the hedgerows, very, sort of very uh, easily pollinated, you'll see lots of insects on them, or even brambles. Uh, it's the, again the same family. Um, Japanese anemones are very easy to uh, split and divide once they get established um, and depending on which variety uh, or, or uh, that you're growing um, they have variations in terms of size of flower, how tall they get of course, um, but some of them have a, a really beautiful sort of uh, markings on the back of the petals. Um, the world's your oyster is very very varied and that's one of the hardest things you have in gardening full stop is actually deciding on which you're going to go for because most of us don't have masses of space. Um, the, main, the main criteria you're going to have to think about is the space you have. So do you go for something which is six inches off the ground or something that gets to perhaps like these uh, up to two to three feet? One thing I'm really keen to do is point people in the right direction of plants that I, I deem as bomb proof or extremely, extremely tough. This plant is called Persicaria, it's in the Bistort family and the Bistort family includes plants like uh, the docks that you know most of us spend time trying to weed out of the garden. Um, so that kind of gives you an inkling as to perhaps how, how strong and tough these plants are. Um, but this particular Persicaria, it doesn't take over in the same way as, uh, as the common dock would. Um, and with our, with our focus again on insects, um, it's the same story in a, in a way here. We've got very small individual flowers on the spike um, and the beauty of the bistorts is that as these flower spikes go over all you have to do is uh, remove, you know, remove one of those flower spikes and the plant is encouraged then to send up yet more, more flowers. And even on a slightly dull day like we have this morning um, this is one of the first plants that the, the bees come to. There's been a lot to talk about already with these flower structures and getting insects. So if you have any further questions, leave a comment below and I'll get back to you.